All right, thank you everyone. Um, sorry about being fashionably late. Uh, we like to create anticipation before any of our presentations. A um, little bit of back background about me is that I've been in uh, uh, industrial communications for about 28 years, maybe a little longer, uh, specifically in oil and gas. Did everything from uh, field connectivity to network infrastructure, whether it was fiber, copper, wireless. Um, prior to coming to T-Mobile, uh, I was a um, it's actually a contract solution engineer for Chevron. Did a lot of uh, proof of concepts for them in California. This is about five years ago. I mean, IT, IoT's been around. It's just got renamed recently. Uh, it's basically communications uh, to remote devices, sensors, and basically taking the real world and digitizing it so we can represent it differently and start applying all kinds of analytics to that as well. Um, so it's, it's, an, it's an exciting, um, uh, technology to be in. It's grown. Uh, I'm getting really busy with uh, a lot of companies like yourself, anywhere from platform providers to um, OEMs that are building sensors for IoT and deploying it. And everybody, you know, at the end of the day, it's about communication. So it's whether you go with LoRa, Sigfox, or NBM1, it's about communication. So as far as the end user is concerned, um, you know, they're agnostic to however you do provide that connectivity. So that's, uh, you know, I learned that from uh, Chevron. Now that I'm with uh, T-Mobile, obviously we like to push our technology, our network, but, uh, you know, there's other companies, you know, AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, that also offer that. And actually, the end goal is, is really to provide connectivity uh, for all these sensors out in the field, uh, you know, so we can hopefully make our lives better. So with that, I'll get started. If you have any questions, don't feel free to interrupt, um, and uh, hopefully I can answer the questions uh, that you guys have. So obviously, this is our you know our, our tagline. We're we're the end carrier. We like to disrupt the industry, um, and so you know we've done a good job over the past years. You know everybody's talking about the uh, you know the acquisition, how it's going to make prices go up. Well, historically. Uh, T-Mobile has driven prices down in the wireless industry from eliminating contracts to uh, introducing competitive pricing and you know, unlimited type of plans. So that's historically what we've done and we'll continue to do that, I believe. So everybody talks, and asks, uh, one of the first questions I get is what's going on with the uh, Sprint acquisition? And uh, all I can say is I, I read what's online. Uh, there's a little bit of talk internally, but apparently, you know, there's a lot of uh, plans going on. Apparently, we've been approved by the DOJ with conditions for the acquisition, and so we have to comply with that as far as I think it's spinning up a, a fourth carrier, which is I believe Dish Network. We're going to divest, um, boost mobile, provide access for a certain time period that the DOJ has specified. Um, so there's a fourth carrier. The biggest concern is, you know, going down to three carriers, is pricing going to go up for the consumer? So we're going to address that. Um, and, uh, you know, in addition to the, it was 12 states, I believe. Now there's 15 states that are trying to sue to block the, uh, the acquisition or the merger, if you want to call it that. You know, we'll see what happens. But that's all I know about it. And whatever you read online is, you know, depending on what you read, it may be true, maybe not true uh, but yeah we're you know T-Mobile is excited <laughs> because with the acquisition of Sprint with the uh, uh, spectrum assets and the fiber that Sprint owns of the ground that's really part of our 5G deployment uh, nationwide so we're excited and uh, we're we, uh, we're happy to have the uh, Sprint family included in our family moving forward So what, what's T-Mobile doing? Well, you know, we're, we're on the path to 5G, just like all the other carriers. Um, just provide, you know, hopefully nationwide connectivity. When you think of 5G, think of really two things. I like to keep it very simple. It's uh, higher throughput, higher bandwidth, and lower latency. Uh, where we, we're looking at multiple gigabytes bi-directionally, and also lower latency in the 20 milliseconds. So essentially, if you take those statistics, or those specifications, you look, wireless will be competing directly with broadband, OK? 
okay, from Wash's perspective. If you look at other countries, um, other countries really have a big focus on wireless. They have been because really the U.S. started out putting uh, wireline in the ground, whether it's copper and fiber. That's what really started the communication um, era as far as telephones and, and eventually the internet providing services to consumers to the internet. Um, so the other countries are kind of backwards where they have actually started with wireless, so they're kind of ahead of us right now. And not that we're playing catch up, but you know, we've got uh, a lot of things to do as far as uh, densifying the, the United States with uh, cell sites and, and providing that connectivity with regards to 5G. So there's other details of 5G, and newer technologies as far as virtualizing the radios, edge computing, which you guys really don't hear about, but that all boils down to when you hear about 5G for an autonomous automobiles and trucks like what Telsa's doing and all these other companies, and um, I think Bill's got a project for uh, air taxis, you know, with a project here in, in uh, Dallas. Is it's all about the latency and the speed of, of the network and how they communicate. Okay, um, 4G technology is where we're at today. We're pushing in some cities. I know all the other carriers have announced uh, 5G in certain areas, and the reason for that is that it's not going to be nationwide right away. Is because it requires densification, adding small cell sites to these metropolitan areas to provide the. Uh, mid-band signal that gives us the speeds. You know, it's no different than your wireless at home that the, uh, you know, the higher the spectrum, the shorter the distance that that, that signal travels. So we've got to densify starting with the cities and eventually move out. Now will we have complete densification in rural areas? Most likely not. So the speeds may not be as fast or the latency may not be as, as uh, fast as, uh, uh, as in, the, in the metropolitan areas. Um, so, with that said, uh, there's other technologies. M1 is, is included in 5G. Uh, narrowband, uh, T-Mobile launched initially with the narrowband. That's really what we're launching for IoT. Uh, it's it's uh, low bandwidth uh, for um, devices. And it, fr from a module perspective, is when you're dealing with remote sensors, a lot of these locations, especially in industrial applications, you may or may not have power to, to, the, uh, to the radios or to the sensors itself. So you want to conserve battery, and I'll get into narrowband M1 and some of the other technologies that are out today. And then 2G, uh, which is really the, the uh, old legacy technology. And one thing that I want to mention about 2G, I think 2G will be around all the time, especially with devices that are roaming like your phones. If you go to third world countries, they don't really have, they, can, they can't afford to upgrade their networks you know, from a wireless perspective. So 2G will always be around. And a lot of your modules, a lot of your phones still have 2G fallback. So I, you know, uh, we're, there's plans for us to sunset both 2G and 3G in 2020. Uh, we'll see what happens because there's a lot of uh, applications where, like tracking devices, that when they go into third world countries, the 2G network, you want to still have them continue to, to function. <coughs> So let's talk about uh, T-Mobile's narrowband. Um, so the standard is really operate in a licensed spectrum environment. Um, so it's not for unlicensed. It's certain spectrum. With T-Mobile, it's currently two bands two, bands four, and our, our guard band, which is band 66. We do have plans uh, launching it on, on 12, which is 700 megahertz. And also, eventually, our 600 megahertz uh, band, which is band 71, which gives us a lot further propagation as far as uh, distance. Um, want it to be scalable. Again, narrowband is really small bits, so it's fully designed for sensors. I see a lot of companies developing uh, narrowband applications for mobile type of applications tracking. It's really, really not designed. Will it work? Yes. But it's really designed for fixed type of wireless applications because narrowband doesn't uh, have a, it doesn't roam very well. So when it moves to a different tower, it has to negotiate a brand new connection. And that's when your, uh, most of your energy is consumed when it's negotiating a new connection. Whereas your traditional phone, for example, 
it, it, it roams, so it knows if it switches, it, it, the, uh, it'll switch to a different carry. It doesn't uh, a different tower or, or radio land, but it doesn't have to re do a full re renegotiation because the network already knows it's on, online. And then uh, security, that's a big issue with uh, IoT, all different things. Um, you know, we'll tell you great, uh, great security and standard keeping your different networks, you know, it's safe. And there's still, you know, ways to, um, you know, to, to get into the, the NVIOT uh, network, you know, pretty complex. But it, it's vulnerable just like anything else. Nothing's 100% secure. Uh, but as far as the cellular um, communication itself, it's, it, that is somewhat secure because we're basically, and all carriers do that, so we encapsulate your data uh, at the module and through our network, then we hand it off uh, you know, to, the, to the customer at that point in time. So narrowband IoT, uh, really lots of applications. I mean, you guys see them now. It's for uh, building monitoring. Again, you're monitoring information as well, as a, whether it's a PLC in an elevator or it's the HVAC system to see what's, you know, how to optimize that to, to save energy and money, et cetera, make your, uh, your system more efficient. Uh, there's street lights, there's parking, these are the usual ones that you see all the time. Asset tracking, again, lost your suitcase. Um, and then uh, metering, you know, as far as utilities, whether it's water, electrical, I know there's some of here that's developing it. There's a lot of companies doing that as well. Um, and that's, it's a big market. You know, for, for, for being able to take that data and then bring it in without having to roll a truck like some of the utility companies do now to reach a meter, won't have to do that anymore. Um, and then equipment monitoring, whether it's for uh, monitoring vibrations to understand maintenance, preventive maintenance for like bearings, etc. There's there's a lot of different applications for for narrow band. Some of the features and benefits is uh, again narrow band. If it's used and deployed right with the right use case, it'll conserve battery because it doesn't use a lot of energy. It typically goes to sleep and wakes up every so often. So, you know, it, it's not using energy when it, or very little when it goes into sleep mode. Uh, again, bands 2, 4, 12, uh, 12 to 2020, 20, we do have narrow band rolled out in a lot of areas. We've got really good coverage on our bands 2 and 4. Right now, uh, we will launch band 12, uh, which is the 700 megahertz in 2020, and expect <coughs> us to launch it on our band 71, which is 600 megahertz, which will give us <laughs> a long range of coverage. Uh, on, on the average, narrow band, uh, the way it's with a small packet and how it's encapsulated, it'll actually uh, propagate further on the same spectrum about 50% further, roughly, depending on the environment, than your phone does. So if your phone connects to a tower at, say, 20 miles, uh, you know, narrow band, it'll, it'll, it'll reach 30 miles from the tower. That's important because that gives you coverage without having to add additional towers. And that's a whole different story we'll talk about towards the end of this. Um, power saving modes, we talked about that. And there's enhanced, what they call uh, DRX support, enhanced deep sleep for battery life. Um, SMS capabilities and then you know certification. We manage narrowband devices different than your phones. So we have a platform platform that manages it. And narrowband doesn't use IP addresses, so it's not IP. So that's part of how it's a little bit more secure than devices that have IP addresses on the network. Um, but we, we have a platform that manages and knows exactly how to get to that device. So here's some um, um, differences between narrowband CAT M1 uh, and then CAT1. So basically what you'll see is that narrowband um, really slots smaller uh, data packets. Uh, your download max is 250 kilobits. Uh, your upload is 230. If you look at M1, that gives you more. Uh, narrowband doesn't support voice, so important. It's not only not designed any type of voice applications. Whereas if you, you have a voice application but you don't want to go to a true CAT1 solution, 
then uh, M1 is, is probably where you need to go as far as your use case. So if you look at the uh, uh, throughput, it's one megabit, both up and down. It does support voice or Volte, and there's SMS support. So your battery life, you know, depending, again, it really depends on your pulse cycles. How often are you communicating with the device? So, you know, they say narrow band up to 10 years. That's part of pulling it every once a day, maybe once every other day. Um, whereas if you change your polling rate to do to pull every hour, 15 minutes, you're going to significantly reduce your, your life. So um, I always kind of laugh when I, I see OEMs that say, hey, our, we can, our battery could last, last for 10 years. My issue with that is that the devices haven't been out 10 years, so how do you know? <laughs> you know? So you've got to kind of be careful with that. And they really understand what their pull rates are. Uh, M1, I'm not that familiar with because our network doesn't support N1, M1. And the old the saying that we have right now is that we're going to purchase a M1 network from Sprint for uh, $26 billion. So I expect that to be, you know, when both companies finally merge or technologies come together, they have customers that we're not going to, to let hang in. So we're going to integrate the M1 network into our network eventually. Um, and again, they're saying that five to ten years. And then you look at your cat one that's been around for a long time, basically LTE devices, uh, different throughputs, it's 10 megabits, uh, download and five upload. Uh, look at your uh, millisecond, <coughs> under 50 milliseconds, uh, M1 is under one second, and then uh, narrow band is, is 10 seconds, less than 10 seconds. Um, narrow band devices typically aren't that critical, so you don't really need a low latency, whereas with maybe cat, and one different use case, you might need higher. And then um, Cat1 itself, you know, that's traditional uh, like LTE devices. Um, and again, there's no, really no saying for battery life because people use that, that differently. Phones will probably have anywhere from, I'm gonna say Cat4 device all the way up to uh, six, you know, your phones. I mean, you're gonna get the best speeds on your phone. That's the way they're designed, so. So here's some of the use cases. Again, we kind of talked about this: sensors, metering. You know, all all, all the use cases under under narrow band are typically small monitoring, remote monitoring, collecting little bits of data. Um, and it talks about handy connections today. And again, we bring this up because that's really going to tell you what your battery life is. Um, and then your projected message size: uh, 50 times 100 or 150. Um, and then, you know, your uh, data usage per day, roughly 100 megabytes per day, uh, you know, or, and there's a max. So it'll vary depending on your use case. And then the latency, you know, for some of these use cases, 20 to 60, 10 to 20 for city lighting, parking. And, and every time you get under a, under a millisecond, you're really not going to notice, you know, unless you're on your computer or you're doing some type of video, which is a completely different application. Um, but for narrowband, again, it's really designed for fixed type of sensors. Um, and then, you know, mobility, again, um, narrowband's not really designed to be mobile, so you know, keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, but, uh, you know, it can be. I mean, I've had uh, a tracking device we were testing, and I was in California from uh, the Bay Area all the way down to San Diego. We actually drove. When I go out to California, I have so many meetings, I just drive because they're all over California. And we were able to track it all the way down. Now, the battery life, that's a different story, but it will work. So uh, I'm not going to say it's not an application. If you're if you have a if you have a, a use case where you have supplemental power, it's not just on battery, then you're probably fine with narrowband. So keep that in mind. There's a lot of um, you know cold chain management applications where you want to monitor the the refrigeration inside of a truck, but you have power to it from the truck, and that that's you know that's acceptable. Yeah, that'll work just fine. Um, so here's a comparison to a lot of the other technologies. You know, starting with your 2, 3G LTE narrowband. It's not that it's T-Mobile's narrowband; it's just narrowband. So, 
There's Sigfox and Laura, which a lot of you guys are working on applications in Sigfox and Laura. Nothing wrong with these technologies. It just look you got to look at what your solution is and what your uh, requirements are, and then pick what you think is best. You know, a lot of companies are price sensitive, so. You know, if, if you look at obviously a 2G, 3G module to build a device, the module itself is probably going to be $20, $25 for the module. If you look at narrow band, it's probably $5. So the price comes down dramatically. And then you look at Sigfox and Laura, and I'm not that familiar with the pricing, but it's probably, what, under a dollar, guys, for the device sensor? Roughly a couple dollars. So, but then you look at, okay, what's, you know, what's my, what do I need? for my transport as far as bandwidth. So you look at, uh, you know, obviously 2, 3, 2G, 3G LTE, this is going to be more, it says 300 <coughs> megabits, but you go far beyond that. Um, narrowband, today with narrowband 1, your, your maximum is 230 down, and, and uh, 250 down, and two, 230 up, so you're limited. But again, you're not really wanting to push a lot of uh, uh, band, uh, data across narrowband. Same thing with six blocks. So you go from, uh, you got uh, 600 bits and 100 bits compared to narrow band, and you've got LoRa, you know, you're just significantly less, but you're cheaper because, you know, those tags are much cheaper. So if you're tracking, say, for example, I mean, there's a lot of applications for, like, um, tracking cattle, for example. If you're just tracking cattle, that's perfect because you're not going to get a farmer to, or a rancher to pay, you know, 20, 30 bucks for each each uh, you know cow that he has on it, on his property, and then then you have to look at uh, which network has the best coverage for your customer, and that's where you have to kind of be agnostic. Obviously, from T-Mobile, I'd like to say we we will have coverage everywhere. You know, but the other carriers will say the same thing too. And we're all working on it, you know, so that's a positive thing for your customers and for your business is that between all the carriers, uh, we will have coverage. And then you'll still have the Sigfox and the LoRa uh, technology as options to deploy what's best for your customer in pricing. So, you know, not one is really better than the other. Just what is your use case, of which you have to look at. Okay. Um, what do we got here, Dave? Uh, kind of redundant in, in data profiles. So again, I, we're going over the different uh, use cases. Yeah, there's a lot of you notice there's a lot of bicycles. <laughs> and in Dallas and everywhere in all the cities. Now there's, uh, I mean, scooters too. So that's where uh, narrowband is, is a fairly perfect solution for that. Again, it goes back to price. You can do it on more and you can do it on Sigfox. So you have to really look at your use case and what your, uh, you know, whether your customer is price sensitive as far as deploying an application. Okay, let's go a little bit into 5G now. So 5G evolution. Okay. All the carriers are heading towards 5G. Uh, there's, I think, to a certain degree with consumers primarily, um, that 5G is going to give you everything that everybody talks about, which is the two things, uh, multiple gigs, bidirectional, and 20, you know, under 20 millisecond um, latency. That's not necessarily true because uh, there's more to 5G. Are all the carriers, including T-Mobile, yes, we're rolling that. We want to roll that out nationwide. As you get to the rural areas that you don't have the luxury of densification that you do in the metropolitan areas, like, for example, downtown Dallas or L.A., so it requires all the carriers to add small cells for the mid-band spectrum. That gives you your speed, okay? Um, and everybody says, oh, we're going to have... Um, 5G, we're going to have speeds nationwide. We're going to have 5G nationwide, but the speeds are going to vary, so the technology may vary as well. We may not, we, you know, we're not going to deploy mid-band spectrum that only travels 600 feet in a rural area. It's just not cost-effective to do that. And if there's no one's using it, you know, it's not worth the investment. Whereas in your, your, your uh, metropolitan areas, when you're supporting stuff like autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous air taxis, for example, yeah, you want that deployed downtown areas. And that's, that's what all the carriers are doing. Um, so it's, you know, again, next level, high speed, lower lace, massive connectivity, moving forward, billions of connections, primarily in the metropolitan areas. And critical communications, obviously, when we're, we're launching these uh, autonomous vehicles, we've got to make sure that 
you know, it's, you know, we're, the network's reliable and, and deliver the speeds and the latencies that, that 5G has to offer. I touched a little bit about uh, what, what requires to deploy 5G and densifications based on the spectrum that you have available. Since, since all the carriers have licensed spectrum by the FCC, that's critical, critical to know and critical to have for the carriers as far as deployment. And so we talked about uh, dense urban areas and metropolitan areas. Because that's where your uh, millimeter wavelength comes into play. Okay? Higher speeds because the, the signal is much higher and a shorter distance. The higher the signal, the shorter the distance, more bandwidth, lower latency. And so if your signal with your millimeter wavelength, as an example, only travels 600 feet, then you have to add more small cells within that area, every 600 feet. So if you look at, a, look at downtown Dallas, for example, you're probably looking at 1,500 just in the downtown area, small cells are deployed to get you, you your maximum speeds and throughput. So when I talk about that and people say we're going to have it right away, all the carriers, all the cell tower companies like uh, U.S. Tower and Crown Castle are working on that and all these other uh, partners that we use and like all other carriers, they use contractors to build out these um, cell sites or locations for cells and we, we co-locate with our, our the other carriers so I mean we're waiting just like everybody else for these to be built. That takes time. Uh, there's lots going on with, with the cities they want to charge the cell providers at one point in time you know like a thousand dollars per site. Well that's not economically realistic especially if you're deploying thousands in a city environment. Um, so I guess the FCC, from what I read online, kind of put that to a halt. The maximum, I think, is, is only like $100 to have, you know, that's a month uh, fees for, for all carriers to pay to have uh, small cells deployed. When you look at mid-band, you're looking at a little further areas, which is typically, um, you know, <coughs> your, your spectrum that travels further, not much further, probably a mile or two, a couple miles. Um, and, but the, the throughput's going to be less than your millimeter wavelength and your latency is going to be real close. It's not going to be significantly different. And then your low band nationwide. That is your rural areas. Uh, like, for example, I'm, I'm really into the oil and gas and what's going on with the Permian Basin because uh, there's a lot of money being spent by that industry. And uh, we don't have 700 out there uh, because at the time our focus was consumers. There's not a lot of consumers in West Texas bunch of coyotes and little lizards and stuff like that. They're not using cell phones. But in the last, you know, probably 10 years, the Permian has gotten uh, to be pretty big. Um, the good thing where I think T-Mobile has the advantage is about just two years ago now, the FCC uh, reformed 600, which was the old uh, TV white space they used to transmit broadcast on, um, 600. And we're fortunate to win um, a bunch of 600 megahertz spectrum, I think like 45% nationwide, including in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so now we've been rolling that out the last year, year and a half, and I just had a discussion with uh, one of my potential customers out there, and, and our, our, our coverage for the Permian has, has significantly changed from a year ago. Now people are going out there with our cell phones that support 600, they have 71, and they're getting communications, they're getting voice communications. Um, we're work, we have devices uh, coming out now. We have actually had a device, one of the first device certified, which is a, a modem slash router that we're, we're, we were testing out in West Texas, you know, to provide connectivity for the rigs, et cetera, or if uh, the oil companies have remote type of communications for all the facilities, you know, uh, control and automation type. And I'm going to give a shout out to BSIC Technologies. They're the ones that were the first to come out with that. Uh, it's been certified on our network. We're kind of excited about it. Um, the other chipset manufacturers are coming out with their chipsets. Uh, but BEC was the first one to work with another chipset manufacturer and go to market with that. So we're kind of excited about that. <coughs> so we're testing it out there now. Now, again, we don't have complete coverage. 
but the coverage is much better out there. Um, and the thing with the oil companies, first of all, is they have to have two-way voice communications for safety. That's really critical to them. And then the IoT applications come in afterwards. So that's kind of an explanation about timing and, and what, are, what are some of the struggles, not just with T-Mobile, but the other carriers as far as densifying the U.S. for full 5G coverage. So. Um, here's, you know, here's, again, applications, you guys, you're looking at this, you know, the solution providers, the OEMs, you guys are all building devices, solutions, whether it's a platform uh, that you're building for IoT. These are the traditional ones that you're seeing. Everybody is doing this. You know, uh, so it's really important is to understand, first of all, um, the devices, the sensors that are available on the market. If you're not an OEM, if you're an OEM, you need to understand the supply chain for the chipsets, like from the Qualcomm's, uh, the Telets, the Jamaltos, and all those guys, because they're still building their chipsets and they have to meet certifications for 5G, and that's kind of a moving target. So, you know, you'll see chipsets come out on the market and go away, but, and, but it's because they're trying to, you know, meet all the requirements. So the chipset manufacturers, from a uh, logistics point of view, supply chain uh, point of view, need to come out first with the module. Then the OEMs take that module and integrate it to the PCBs and create, whether it's a modem, a router, a sensor, so really understanding that's important, okay, that's the first thing. Second thing is connectivity, okay, for your customer, is who's got the connectivity, whether it's Narrowband, M1, Laura, uh, Sigfox, is understanding that, okay? And then last is a platform. I have a lot of platform customers come to me, and I actually, there was an article in Gardner report that the biggest failure for platform providers is they don't understand the ecosystem as far as the modules, or the connectivity. So understanding is that is very important, okay, um, where you're at, because at the end of the day, platform providers make money if they're collecting data and processing it. If you're not processing it, you don't have any customers, so really, and that's where a lot of you guys come in that build, you know, like OEMs and even the solution providers understanding the entire ecosystem as far as providing a solution, and us as a carriers, so whether it's AT&T or our competitors, you know, we're, we're around. And we're all striving to provide nationwide coverage, and that'll be there. It's just going to take time. Our strategy is really no different than any other carrier strategy. It's one network. We want, we want to be first to go nationwide with 5G. Uh, and that's, I think, that's one of the reasons why uh, we, we started looking at, at the acquisition of Sprint. You know, Sprint has a, has a lot of spectrum, as I mentioned. They have fiber. Uh, that's part of the 5G uh, uh, strategy or spec is having fiber to your towers because if you're providing multiple gigabits to each device on that tower, you need to have the bandwidth. Uh, doing a microwave backhaul is not going to cut it. You know, you're, you're getting about anywhere from 100 megs to 600 megs, 800 megs on microwave. But if you've got devices that are in the gigs that are consuming that much data, that's your bottleneck. It's going to be your, your back home. So fiber is really the key uh, for that. When you're talking about low latency and very, very high bandwidth throughput. Um, our 600 megahertz, you know, we feel is an advantage to us because we can still deploy, deploy connectivity without having to have that many towers. You know, we don't have to wait to provide extended coverage. A good example of that is West Texas. There's a very minimal amount of towers out there compared to other areas, but because 600 propagates further than 700, which I think AT&T has as well, um, we've got a little bit better coverage, and that's important, you know, for providing coverage nationwide. And then we're all, you know, all of us are starting to uh, deploy millimeter wavelength in, this, in the uh, uh, metropolitan areas. Again, we're waiting on on locations we can install small cells. It's not us, we're ready to go. All the carriers are ready to go. We're waiting to, to have that infrastructure in place. Um, and then the, obviously the best ubiquitous mobile experience for our customers. If we have the best, then chances are we're gonna get more customers. And I think all the carriers strive to be the best. I mean, we're always battling it out. 
saying who's best. You know. <coughs> At the end of the day, that's like great for the consumers, great for your customers that we're doing that. Um, and then again, multiple use cases. Some of the things I, get, I want to mention, you guys know the traditional ones, you know, so most of you have heard about edge computing. Edge computing down at the RAM level um, with the carrier, with the equipment manufacturers, the radio manufacturers like Nokia and Ericsson. You know, they've got technologies where they're actually virtualizing the radio. It's all software based um, versus hardware based. And that allows them to do a lot of things. It's pushing uh, edge computing down to the RAM level and not having to take that data to the cloud. And that's important. And what that does as well is if you're able to do some edge processing, you're not transporting data on your back to all the way to the cloud. So you're minimizing the amount of traffic, you know, for example, on our core network. That saves, you, saves us a lot of uh, time and, and it optimizes our backhaul. Um, kind of redundant slide, you know, LTE, 5G, millimeter wavelength, 600 for uh, rural areas is our, our strategy. These are some of the, uh, and, and most of you may be already know, especially if you're an OEM, uh, the ch ch chipset manufacturers. Uh, Qualcomm's a big one, uh, and then Sierra Wireless, just about all these other uh, uh, module manufacturers use Qualcomm chipsets. <coughs> so if Qualcomm is, is delayed in, in, in announcing or developing a chipset to support 5G, that's what's going to be the delay as far as the technology being rolled out you know, to, the, to the rest of the public. Because everybody here is, is waiting on Qualcomm chips for the most part. There's some other chip manufacturers uh, that are on the market um, that they could use, but um, for the most part, everybody, you know, the big ones like Sierra Wireless, uh, Intel, these guys, they rely on the chipset from Qualcomm. So it's not really the carriers, we're working on it, but it's uh, supply chain, you know, coming chipsets. So the OEMs can build devices that we can deploy on our networks. With that said, that's the end of the presentation. You guys are pretty quiet. So any questions? You had mentioned a whole bunch of applications, but what are you seeing as the emerging killer app for, for, for 5G based on your experience and talking with customers. What is the one that um, I can't tell you what the killer app is because I heard of new tech. You know, my job, I deal with uh, end users, I deal with solution integrators, I, do, I deal with OEMs that build out, uh, and I deal, with, I deal with the module, not necessarily. I, I hear what the module manufacturer is coming with, so I can position my OEMs to say, hey, look at this module or this chipset to build your device. I mean, I go back to, you know, saying, if you think it, you can do it, basically. And, and IoT is all about um, taking the real world and digitizing it. So we see it differently and we can analyze it. But, you know, the ones that were, that were on the presentation, those are typical ones. There's, there's other ones out there and you just gotta think about what's that new one. I will tell you that I have a lot of startups, smaller startups, and they have the highest rate of failure. And it's because they may have been in the industry. And I'll give you an example of one. They were he retired. He took, I don't know, half a million dollars of his retirement and said, hey, I'm going to do a tractor. You know, I'm thinking, okay, this is not good because how many tractors are out there? <laughs> There's a number of tractors. Pet tractors, tracking cows, tracking luggage, tracking parcels, tracking everything. Okay, and they're just putting a different spin on it. And now we have to, then, then we have to deal with the uh, module and the chipset manufacturers. You have to pick a technology and say, okay, you know, for my use case, for what I'm developing, what module, which, which chipset's best? Is it narrowband, is it M1, et cetera? You gotta think about all those things. And then there's challenges when you know, there's, let's talk about certification. That in itself could take you, you know, a few months, three months to get through. And I tell everybody is if you can find some, th something off the shelf to go to market with, the most important thing, and I think you guys will agree to this, is go to market. Speed to market. Because you could have a, a solution that you think that's the next best thing since sliced bread. Six months later, you've got competition. They've already deployed it. 
into the market and you're going to lose. And that's kind of the scenario that I have for this guy. Small, didn't really understand it. Um, they all have aspirations of being the next billionaire, <laughs> you know, with their, their idea. But it, it, it always happens. I hear about this, I listen to them. And prior week and the following week, I hear the same story, same application. So my suggestion is, depending on where you're at, if you're a platform provider, look for the devices that are going to get, get the data to your platform and then also with the, the carriers, you know, whether it's T-Mobile, hopefully it's T-Mobile. But, you know, the reality of it is, and it's like this with the other carriers, is that we may not have coverage everywhere you need coverage and vice versa. So you've got to look at that. So if we have an LPWA platform and we're uh, planning on integrating uh, MDIoT or, or something like that into our existing LoRaWAN activity, so if I'm reading through the tea leaves, Q420 will be, that's really what will be widely available for MDIoT? Um, we want it to be, but again, I go back to towers being built us deploying and being on a certain spectrum. Right now we have two and four as far as compared to band 12 or 700 and our band 71, that distance is a lot shorter, okay? So you may not have coverage. Now, in 2020, we, I mean, we're planning on, uh, there, there's a firm um, commitment to, to deploying narrow band on band 12, which is 700, that's gonna give you much more coverage with the existing towers that we currently are located on. You know, so that's going to give you probably, I don't know, 40 miles maybe from the tower. And then uh, hopefully, I'm hopeful because, I mean, I'm excited about band 71, 600, is we'll have further um, coverage on that. So that will probably be in the 50, 60 mile range with narrow band. Again, it's going to vary based on train and, and, you know, signal propagation and all that. And that same line, I mean, at my farmhouse, we have coverage from T-Mobile. Yep. It works if I'm 20 feet up a tower facing north. Yep. If I change, I don't have coverage. How is T-Mobile going to change their coverage maps to help people like that that are trying to see, do I have coverage, do I have sufficient coverage, do I have reliable coverage, and then when it starts to fade out, how do I know it's a network issue versus a device issue? If you're running 10,000 units, it becomes a big cost. Good question. So one really one important thing is if your strategy is say, hey, I know T-Mobile's deploying narrow band on, say, for example, um, band 12 or 700, and I want to be part of it when uh, T-Mobile deploys it on uh, band 71 or 600, okay? You've got to make sure, one of the most important things, and I think all the carriers in the room will agree, is that with the, ch the challenge with bring your own device type of things, I'm talking about cell phones now, is that the customer doesn't understand which his module supports, his chipset, which band frequencies and all that. So number one, make sure you're, you've got the right chipset to support our bands for whatever technology that you're looking at. If it's narrow band, there's a lot of chipsets that don't support bands 12 or, or band 71 today. So, so that's you're really comparing important. 600 to 700, that makes sense. But in a lot of cases, you're dealing with the topography. That means, do I, can I use a carrier at all? Or do I have to bring my own base station to do that last RF leg in a private network like LP, like Florida? I mean, that, that's really where it comes down to. Yeah, so absolutely. Have problems. I mean, we've all called cell phone companies trying to figure out why our calls are dropping. They say switch to Wi-Fi. Yeah. You know. Um, our coverage maps, and I think that's the same with the other carriers. I mean, that's just basically predictive analytics. We're not looking at at the contour of the earth at that location because we really unless we bring that into like an Esri file and use some more complex or GIS, we can't really do that. And even then, it's only predictive analysis, okay? When I worked uh, for the air oil company um, in California, I spent probably about six months doing coverage mapping in all their leases throughout Central California. And other carriers have coverage, you know? So I have two recommendations because I've been on that side of the house is, if you're considering a carrier, T-Mobile as well, is get, you know, get a device. For example, what I'm doing in West Texas, now that I know that 600 is launched there, I'm not gonna just tell my customers, hey, look at our coverage map, we have coverage. Because inevitably, this happened to me 9.5 to 10 out of time, 10, 10 times, 
in California, this was five years ago, that they didn't have coverage. Well, our map shows we have coverage. That's not the point. The point is, do you have coverage? So there's a saying, you've got to put boots on the ground. And that's what I'm doing with BDC device, is that we're deploying that with uh, part or solution providers, integrators, and they're, gonna, they're doing ground testing. I don't ever tell my, well, I don't say I ever, but I don't, because I've been there before, so we got, look at our coverage map, we have coverage. No, I say, hey, you know what? I understand what technology you're going with. Here's one of our partners that has a device that's, that is optimized for our, our, um, our bands. Take that device out there. Make sure yourself you've got the coverage. Because if you don't, you know, you're going to think, hey, he, just, he lied to me. I don't want to lie to you. I want to be real about it. Yeah, so and that's, that, that's a good approach. I guess my concern is if I'm managing a fleet, and the radio conditions change, and I start to get partial, and I start having dropouts. Today, when I call up a carrier, it's real mundane. I mean, if I'm running 10,000 units, I need to get to tier three pretty quickly. Is yeah. T-Mobile setting it up so that some of these device guys have access to better troubleshooting or higher level technical expertise, or is it they're just another subscriber? Yeah, the customer that has the, uh, well, it depends. I mean, if you're a direct customer of T-Mobile, you have access to that. And when I work with my customers, I mean, I'll, I'll go out and I'll talk to RF Engineering. I was pushing RF Engineering to start working with oil companies and seeing how we could deploy 600 megahertz faster. I'm not the only one in T-Mobile, you know, but I, I'm a, I, I was a big voice on that, whether they listen to me or not, because I mean, I'm a BDM out in the field, right? But my background, you know, for 28 years was oil and gas. And, and you know what? Oil and gas has a lot of sensors. They're monitoring everything. And to me, the way I looked at that is because I, I didn't come from a retail type environment, and I'm in IoT, that's more commercial and industrial type of application. So you got to really understand that. So, I pushed that. I mean, I stared at coverage maps. I talked to RF Engineering. Okay, what, where's our, where's the cell sites? Where's our radios? Does it have 700 or 600? Because that was critical to T-Mobile. We didn't have 700. AT&T had 700. I think we didn't. Uh, and then, like I said, it, it, it depends on to really do it right. If you find it, find a person that that gets it. He'll work with RF Engineering. Get tower maps. They'll tell you what spectrum we have, or that that carrier has deployed. In our case, 600, and I could map it out. And I could say, hey, we got we got 600 here, here, and here. Where are you deploying your devices? And then we can try to articulate whether we'll have coverage. But ultimately, I'm going to say, you know, get a device, make sure it supports 600 or band 71, and take it out there. It's the best way to do it. Are all the carriers working on nationwide coverage? Absolutely, but that just takes time. So it's kind of a tough. Answer um, With 5G, um, how is roaming going to work if all the carriers are using different frequencies? <coughs> um, works fine. <laughs> Basically, if, you, if we have a roaming agreement with another carrier, this is really more internationally now. Um, and we do have roaming agreements with, I, I'm sure we do with, with AT&T, Verizon, Sprint today. Oh. In some areas we don't have coverage, we just partner together. Um, it, it doesn't really matter on, on your spectrum. As long as you have that agreement, then you'll be able to roam and, and your device is compatible on that other network. You know, I'm thinking more international, like if you're going to Australia or Mexico, which is Telefonica or Rogers, you know, they have similar spectrum. It's it's all about whether your your device supports their spectrum. But run is not okay. national. Security. So 5G is going to allow us for capacity, but the, as far as security goes, I mean, I would hate to be driving out, you know, sitting in an autonomous car and somebody hacks the sensor on the road, which is right now they're all open-ended. So, what what is T-Mobile's? Did you plan? mention blockchain? <laughs> I'm also dating a blockchain founder, so this is like constantly in my ear. Um, and he did a lot of logistics in Hong Kong for a long time, yeah. so he's very much involved in the cybersecurity world. So yeah, and you know, from a T-Mobile perspective, we secure our network the best we can with current technology, but there's are there going to be other companies and vendors that have more enhanced like blockchain is probably a good one. Uh, you know, there's lots of technologies today. Um, it, it's as far as carriers' point of view is that we're relying on them to securing that because you know we only have their the data from when we collect it from the device through our core. Once we hand that off, we have no control of it. Okay. 
So, um, you know, if, if you're looking at a device that has an Ethernet interface and that's how you're connecting to the network for whatever reason, yeah, you can intercept that traffic, it's IP, etc. cetera. Um, but we basically secure it, encapsulate that data through our network and then hand it off. Now, at the very edge, you know, if you're talking about a sensor, then, you know, and again, I just hear this, I'm no expert, but there's certificates and all that that you put at a at the uh, module level. And some of these uh, sensors and, and um, modems now use like ARM processing. And so you can put whatever it is for security on that device itself and secure at that end. And, and part of, you know, I know a little bit about blockchain uh, with distributed um, um, ledgers. You know, so that could be important too. So I think that's going to evolve as, you know, the technologies, you know, that is probably the number one issue to solve is security. I would just add in that 5G does have advanced cybersecurity yeah. standards that were released last year. It is what makes 5G, it's going to drive us to 5G more so than 4G, if you had anything. So, on your original slides, you showed uh, 2020 as the date that you're supporting 2G, right? Sunsetting 2G. Sunsetting, yeah. yeah. And, and support. Well, it's, it, you didn't say you're sunsetting it. Then you said support through. That's the difference than sunsetting. Mm -hmm. yeah. You could leave the network on and still yeah. have support. Yeah, and through, I will right? tell you right now. So, so my my, my yeah. question. I, this is a. Go ahead. What's the narrative in the field when you don't have narrowband IoT up through 2020 in in most places? Your discussion, your, in your discussion, you talked about tracking cattle. You also made the statement you have coverage everywhere, and then you said you don't have good coverage in, in, in rural areas because you don't have the luxury of densification. Well, to the best of my knowledge, cattle are not roaming the streets in downtown Dallas. They're in rural areas, and you're not going to have the narrowband coverage out there. So what's the, what's, so what's the narrative with the client? with your client as a BDM out there in transitioning them from 2G and 3G? to these other technologies, because right now, at the end of Q2, 100, uh, 113 million cellular IoT connections in the U.S., 71% of them are 2G and 3G. So what's the narrative with the client? So the narrative is that, yeah, we're, we still have 2G and, or 3G and 2G. 3G, it's pretty much confirmed we're going to sunset that in 2020. 2G is still kind of open. And the reason why is because we have third world countries that have roaming devices. And if their default is 2G, then we still got to support them. Now, I, I can't answer the question as far as sunsetting from the other carriers. That's a separate you know, discussion that we'll have with them. Um, but as far as coverage, you know, we're all working on it, period. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, can I tell you, yeah, we, we're going to have narrowband coverage nationwide? We're working on it. Someday we will, maybe. I don't know. Um, it depends what the strategy is. And, uh, you know, and again, uh, one of the factors for us, not necessarily a factor, but, you know, 600 is, is um, you know, propagation signals much further. That helps. What, what's your former employer, you know, the oil company say about this stuff? They build, they, they're are, building are they, out they, their they, own networks, period, okay. right now, okay? But I will tell you that, you know, uh, there are discussions with uh, companies in uh, Houston, all the majors that are operating in the Permian. They don't want to maintain their own infrastructure. It's too costly. So, you know, the strategy is, you know, as a carrier, T-Mobile, working with them, they're, they've already built, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that it, it hinges on our coverage for all the carriers hinges on how many towers are built and where they're built at. Permian Basin is a good example. All the, most of the oil companies that have, they have significant investments, they have fiber to their own towers. You know, they, don't have, they don't have licensed spectrums. So the strategy for us, T-Mobile, is to partner with them, utilize their infrastructure, put our radios on there, provide that coverage. You know, not that we don't want to, is there's a, I go back to supply chain, towers are a supply chain. If those towers can't get built, we can't provide coverage in that area. So we got to look at um, more ways to provide coverage. But ultimately, all the carriers, we want to provide coverage nationwide. So hope that answers your question. <laughs> Anything else? One more. 
Um, biologically speaking, you know, we have an electromagnetic force in our body of 60 times that in our heart, then our brain, and all these other things that I feel like aren't being addressed as far as impacting 5G on our actual bodies. Do you guys do any testing or is that a dialogue that you're pursuing? Um, I can't answer that question because I'm not that I can answer that one for you. So, uh, so FCC has a set of uh, compliance regulations from SAR, specific absorption rate testing, okay. which relates to uh, our frequency going into the body. And so if, when you, whenever you get a product tested, you do about EMI or FCC certification, there's also the SAR certification. Same thing with uh, laptop computers. Anything within 12 centimeters of the human body is required to have an SAR test done to it to make sure it doesn't uh, go beyond the specific absorption rate uh, frequencies. We've, we've found in, in research that within 12 centimeters of the human body can start having cellular degradation. <coughs> so when the FCC sets that limit, and now with 5G, they're going to be modifying the SAR regulations for that. Uh, the problem with our frequencies, it's magical. We still don't really know what's going on. We forget that asbestos, Years ago, everyone thought it was so safe, there were even scientists who were eating it on black and white TV because it was totally safe, and then later we found out it's really bad for you, right? So RF, we really don't know, but as we progress with technology, the FCC is moving to uh, increase that, the regulation compliance issues. So if you need help with that, I have to help. <laughs> <laughs> yourself going up to your ear, the RF energy penetrates halfway through your head. Which is why they recommend using that cord. Of course, the uh, 60 hertz that you're standing next to over there also penetrates through all of our heads right now. Exactly. <laughs> I'm exactly. sure. That may explain a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. I got one. Okay. Do you guys have any uh, plans with CBRS or private LTE? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Well, today. That was actually my question also. Um, I had a very interesting conversation with a, a representative from Qualcomm in the RMT group. And they actually had, there's a, one of the large care, or, um, shippers, I should say, and you wouldn't tell me which one, actually took out over 100 Wi-Fi nodes and replaced it with four uh, private LTE nodes at better coverage and better speed and all the in, uh, is issues that you typically have with uh, uh, contingency with products and our mobile devices moving around completely uh, eliminated the problem at a, in one of their facilities at, at the ramp. So, encourage you to look into that um, because eliminating Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there, there's, there's use cases, there's certain conditions. Um, anytime, today, anytime you go in an area that's really dense, you know, no coverage. For example, airports are a good thing. You know, we don't have a lot of, you know, we got towers on the outside of the airport and it's trying to get into the baggage area, you know, where you got brick walls, you got steel, you got everything. And that affects your signal, so you've got to look for the for the uh, signal that's going to propagate. And that, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, it sounded like it was an airport situation. You know, so they have luxury. You can go in with uh, like a LoRa solution in place, or or uh, you know RFID tags. You know, there's a cheap. And that's where your use case comes in, and looking what the the customer's pain points are. You know. Uh, T-Mobile is not going to go in and put, uh, you know, well, we can probably put small cells in. You know, that's a whole different story in itself as far as dealing with politics and, you know, um, you know, these type of facilities. But going in and putting a, uh, like a, uh, like a Bluetooth tag or a beacon or whatever the case is for short distances um, and putting multiple in, in that type of environment works perfect. So, I'd say, you know, look at your use case, look at your conditions. Oh, okay. uh, nice just, question. Just quickly, uh, to follow up on that, I, mean, I, I worked in, a, in an overseas market, and one major difference is the inbuilding and the, and the campuses. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, what's your take, my observation, and it's only on observation, I think that uh, DAS and IBS is not as big in, in, at least in the markets I've been here, whether it was in Atlanta or here, as opposed to other markets in the world. Uh, there's not much emphasis on coverage inside the campuses and buildings as opposed to outside. Is that a regulatory thing? Is that a business uh, decision? Uh, yeah. No, it's quite the opposite. Is that we have customers, you know, large customers um, that uh, need in building <coughs> access because now they're deploying um, the, instead of connecting to to the Wi-Fi, you know, these companies that are deploying solutions with these companies want in, want a direct connection because if you connect to the Wi-Fi, you know, and something changes internally and dealing with all the politics with IT groups, you know, throughout the organization, it's very difficult. With uh, LTE backhaul to like a router or whatever, they can manage their internet, they control their connectivity. Um, but no, we, we do a lot of in building upon you know with requests to the customer. So it's really yeah, I think that's the key difference. Uh, yeah. I, it's, a, it's probably more reactive and it's per, per request as opposed to a, a, a carrier set of procedures. That yeah, is, yeah. Uh, I don't think any carrier is going to automatically provide in building. Right. They got to get a request from customer. Great. Let's give them a hand, guys. Thank you.